Speaking in January 2019, after his team had been knocked out of both the League Cup and the FA Cup within the space of just three days, Maurizio Pochettino told journalists, quote, People wish we could win some trophies, but being realistic, we are doing so well. To win a title here in England like the FA Cup or Carabao Cup is about being lucky, not only about quality in your squad. Adding, sometimes when you assess football, you only look at which team won and which team lost, but you have to consider all the circumstances. End quote. A cynic might suggest that of course Pochettino would say that. Famously, or infamously if you like, despite doing what was widely considered to have been an excellent job at Tottenham, Pochettino never won anything in North London. But maybe Maurizio has a point. Once upon a time, footballers weren't judged solely upon the size of their trophy cabinets. Stanley Matthews was almost universally considered to be the best player in England, if not the world, throughout much of a more than 30-year career in the game, despite only winning his first and only trophy at club level at the age of 38. Tom Finney, his old wing partner and a fellow two-time FWA Footballer of the Year winner, just like Matthews, was held in similarly high regard despite winning nothing during his 20-year career, playing for Preston North End. Brazilian legend Socrates never won more than a state championship at club or international level. German genius Bernd Schneider only ever won runners-up medals in the Bundesliga, DFB Pokal, Champions League and the World Cup. And the little Italian magician Beppe Signori topped the Serie A scoring charts thrice during the league's glory days, but never tasted any glory of his own. Nowadays, though, in any discussion about a player's talents, the honours section of their Wikipedia page is brought up quicker than Sheffield United can race into losing 4-0 at home before half-time. In some ways, it makes complete sense. The economics of modern football dictate that players like Stanley Matthews, Tom Finney and even Giuseppe Signori no longer stick around at clubs like Stoke, Preston and Lazio with the greatest of respect to all three whilst being among the best in their business. And the dominance of the top clubs, where they inevitably end up, means that, in theory at least, the best players in the 21st century ought to be guaranteed impressive trophy halls. But how does that theory play out in the real world? Well, in today's video, as you might have guessed by now, I thought that I'd take a look at some of the best current footballers without a single piece of silverware to their name. And when I say trophyless, I really mean it. There is not a Super Cup, Community Shield, or even a UEFA Nations League in sight, which ruled out the likes of Vissam Ben Yedda, Marcus Toram, and Wilfred Zahar. The only trophies that I will allow are amateur or junior ones in underage competitions because, you know, we've all won one of those. Alright, maybe not that one, but you get the idea. And including them would rule out virtually every footballer on the planet. I also won't be including particularly young players, even if immensely talented, hopefully for obvious reasons. Florian Wirtz is undoubtedly one of the best active trophyless footballers albeit perhaps not for long, but age 20, it would seem a bit reductive to include the likes of him, Moises Caicedo, or even an Ivan Tony, who might be about to turn 28, but is currently in only his third season playing in the Premier League. You know, I could probably have included Tony, but I'm just explaining why I didn't. Without further ado then, who is neither an active footballer nor trophyless, having won the MLS Cup with DC United in his first ever season as a 14 and 15 year old, although that was the only trophy ever won, here are seven of the best current footballers who are somehow still entirely trophyless. Seventh, Jordan Pickford. Picking the first inclusion in this seven was tough. I could have gone with Newcastle's Callum Wilson, who has now scored more Premier League goals than Fernando Torres and Eden Hazard, Atalanta's Turncoop Miners, who reached 2 KNVB Cup Finals with his boy Club AZ, but lost them both, or fellow goalkeeper and Borussia Dortmund number 1, Gregor Kerbel, who obviously came within inches of winning the Bundesliga last season. I know Jordan Pickford is someone who divides opinion, but I think much of the criticism of him, particularly in recent years, is without merit, and ultimately, I think that he's a more solid inclusion than those that I just mentioned. For a start, Pickford is pretty experienced now, having recently turned 30. This is Pickford's eighth straight season as the undisputed number one at a Premier League club, and he has been England's undisputed number one as well for at least six of those seasons. 
capped 58 times to date, Pickford has been outstanding for England at three successive major tournaments, saving as many penalties in the Euro 2020 final penalty shootout as his opposite number Gianluigi Donnarumma, who won the Player of the Tournament award. Pickford has almost won silverware a couple of times with England, but at club level, he's never come close. In his debut campaign at Sunderland, Pickford tasted relegation, and his last few seasons at Everton, including this one, have all involved relegation scraps. In the various cup competitions, Pickford has never got beyond the quarterfinal stage. It feels as though Pickford's best shot at silverware may well be this summer, at Euro 2024, where England are one of two favourites along with France, given the fact that he is contracted to Everton until 2027, and a move to a trophy-laden club doesn't appear to be imminent. Manchester United were reportedly interested in Pickford last summer, before settling on Andre and Arna instead, though, at this stage, even that move wouldn't come with a guarantee of trophies. Sixth. Lewis Dunk. Staying in the Premier League momentarily, and with another England international, Lewis Dunk has won 55 caps fewer than Jordan Pickford, yet he features one place higher in this seven. I would die on the hill that Dunk is unfortunate, only to have won three caps for England, and his career trajectory, starting out at Brighton in League One, being sent out on loan to non-league Bognor Regis and then League One side Bristol City, when he couldn't get in the Brighton team under Oscar Garcia in the Championship, is the reason why he doesn't receive the plaudits that he perhaps should. Dunk defied the doubters to establish himself with his boyhood club in the championship, and he made the PFA Team of the Year the season that the Seagulls won promotion to the Premier League. This is Dunk's seventh successive season in the Premier League, and no one has played more Premier League games for Brighton than him. While so much has changed around the club since Dunk made his debut at the With Dean Stadium, he has remained the one constant. In the Premier League alone, he has had Shane Duffy, Dan Byrne, Benjamin White, Adam Webster, Levi Colville, and Jan Paul Van Heck as centre-back partners, remaining unerringly consistent throughout that time. Dunk is big and strong, but he also reads the game well, and has become extremely proficient on the ball, and in terms of his distribution over the years. I think that you could slot him in at centre-back for almost any club over the last six years, and though he wouldn't necessarily improve them all, let's say Man City or Real Madrid, he could do a job and would never look out of place. The fact that he has only ever been permanently contracted to Brighton, however, age 32, means that Dunk has thus far won nothing. The closest the Seagulls, and therefore Dunk by extension have come, is reaching the semi-finals of the FA Cup, which they did last season, losing on penalties to Manchester United, and in the 2018-19 season, where they lost 1-0 against Manchester City. Fifth, Matias Akanyi. Though I would put my life on me being the first person to have made this comparison, in some ways, Matias Akanyi isn't all that different to Lewis Dunn. What I mean by that is that, like Dunk, Zakanyi's career has been a bit of a slow burner, and he has progressively improved over time, resulting in him not always getting the recognition that he truly deserves. Zakanyi began his career with a tiny semi-professional club called Bellaria Igea in the fourth tier of Italian football, before being snapped up by Hellas Verona and sent on loan to then Serie C sides Venezia and Cittadella. Zakanyi managed to establish himself at Verona eventually, as they yo-yoed almost every season between Serie A and Serie B, before an eye-catching campaign brought about a loan move to Lazio, with a view to a permanent. Lazio only paid 7 million euros for Zakanyi, owing to the fact that he was already 26, but so far, that has proved to be masterful business. Quick, skillful, and increasingly productive in the final third, Zakanyi made 20 goal contributions in 45 games last season, and though he hasn't quite matched those numbers in a massively underachieving Lazio team this season, he has still been their star man. By virtue of his steady climb though, and the fact that Lazio have won nothing since his arrival, he remains trophyless. He has the chance to rectify that this season, with Lazio through to the semi-finals of the Coppa Italia, where they will face Juventus. Juventus, incidentally, are widely reported to be interested in signing Zaccagni, who Lazio are desperately attempting to tie down on a long-term deal. He may also have a shot at winning the Euros with Italy this summer, but having won his first cap in 2022, Zaccagni was left out of Luciano Spalletti's most recent squad, leading to doubts surrounding his potential inclusion. Fourth, Ivis Basuma. 
The youngest player in this seven, I think Evis Basuma is just about a justifiable inclusion based upon his current level of experience, age 27. Basuma made his name at Lille before joining Brighton for £15 million, three years before Lille won an unlikely league on title. Just before joining Lille, in fact, Basuma came even closer to winning silverware when he was part of a Mali team that reached the final of the African Nations Championship, where his team lost 3-0 against DR Congo. If Basuma wanted to end his trophy drought, he had a strange way of going about it, joining Tottenham for £30 million in 2022. I'm sorry, Spurs fans. It was only a joke. Please don't drop dog turds through my letterbox again. Basuma joined Spurs despite reported interest from Arsenal, Man United and West Ham, but his first season at Tottenham, after he was cleared of ongoing sexual assault charges, was a quiet one under Antonio Conte, Christian Stellini and Ryan Mason. This season, however, under Ange Postacoglu, while practically the entire Tottenham team has been greatly improved, Basuma has been one particular standout. A tireless, confident, and technically gifted constant outball, Basuma has won the 12th most tackles in the Premier League this season, narrowly ahead of former Brighton teammate Alexis McAllister, and ranks joint 12th in terms of his pass completion percentage, tied with Rodri. That is impressive company to keep, but whilst McAllister is a World Cup winner who won a league title at Boca Juniors and has already won an EFL Cup at Liverpool, and Rodri won a treble at Manchester City last season, among other things, Basuma has won the same number of trophies as Lee Catamol and has reached fewer finals. Third, Dimitri Payet. I'll be honest, before I started researching this video, I wasn't actually aware that Dimitri Payet was trophyless but as soon as I found out, he was a surefire inclusion. That's not only because Payet was and is a brilliant footballer, who made the League 1 Team of the Year thrice and the PFA Team of the Year in his only full season in the Premier League, but also because of the fact that he is 36 years old. That means that there is every chance that Payet will retire trophyless, with his best shot, now starring for Vasco da Gama in Brazil, probably coming in the Campeonato Carioca, Rio de Janeiro's regional state championship, which Vasco haven't won since 2016. It has been five years since Vasco even made it through to the final, where they were thrashed 4-0 by Flamengo. Meanwhile, the Campeonato Brasileiro seems like an even longer shot for the Frenchman, albeit he does love a long shot, given the fact that Vasco only avoided relegation by two points last season and are 50-1 to one outsiders to win the league in 2024. The closest Payet has come to winning anything today came at Euro 2016, where France reached the final on home soil and Payet made the team of the tournament, but they fell to Portugal in the final and in the 2017-18 Europa League, in which Marseille reached the final and Payet also made the Europa League team of the tournament, but they were well beaten by Atletico Madrid in the final by three goals to nil. Payet was substituted in both of his major final appearances, replaced by perennial trophy winner Kingsley Coman in the Euros final in 2016, and forcibly withdrawn after only 32 minutes in the Europa League final in 2018, with an injury which ruled him out of the 2018 World Cup, which, naturally, France went on to win. Payet is the only player in this seven to have won a senior trophy in a non-friendly competition, namely the Coupe de la Réunion with Excelsior, which he won as a 17-year-old. Football in the French overseas territory, including the Coupe de la Réunion, is an all-amateur affair, however. Thus, Payet is still trophyless, with the only three restrictions being on professional, senior, and competitive trophies. Second, Son Heung-min. I'm not saying that if you're a great player but don't want to win any trophies in the modern era, then joining Tottenham is the best way to go about it, but, well, you know. In all seriousness, Son Heung-min is a great player. Since joining Tottenham almost nine years ago, you'd struggle to find too many players who have been as consistently brilliant in the Premier League, and indeed, for both Hamburg and Bayer Leverkusen before that. One of the greatest Asian footballers to have ever lived, and the greatest of the 21st century, since the best footballer in Asia award was launched in 2013, Son has won it 9 out of a possible 13 times. Son has also won the Tottenham Player of the Year award thrice, 
which is not bad going considering the fact that he had Harry Kane for competition throughout that time. And in the 2021-22 season, he won the Premier League Golden Boot jointly with Mohamed Salah. This season, Son has been outstanding, having made 24 goal contributions in 24 appearances for a Spurs team that is fighting to regain their Champions League status, and he is only four goals behind Erling Haaland in the division's scoring charts. And yet, and you all know what's coming, Son has won the square root of sod all, age 31. Well, actually, that's not strictly true. As some of you watching this, particularly any Koreans, may be screaming into your screens right now, Son did very notably win the 2018 Asian Games, which, much to Tottenham's delight, made him exempt from military service in South Korea. Son still had to do basic military training, but he was able to complete that during the pandemic, avoiding missing any games while the Premier League season was suspended. Football at the Asian Games, however, if you are wondering why Son still features, much like at the Olympics, is officially an under-23 competition, with three overage players allowed to be registered in each squad, one of which, for South Korea, was Son, and therefore, the only trophy Son has ever won was technically a youth competition. That might seem harsh, but as Son no doubt learnt during his mandatory military training, rules are rules. First... Harry Kane. The most obvious top spot since my video about the seven tallest players to have played for Portsmouth, Liverpool, Tottenham and Stoke City and also having performed the robot as a goal celebration, or the one about the biggest wrongs who are currently on loan at Getafe, Harry Kane isn't just the best currently active trophyless footballer, he is a historically great trophyless player. I'm sure he's delighted at that crown. That is to say, even going back to the era of retain and transfer, where players literally could not leave their current clubs without their express permission, and £12 a week maximum wages, which meant there was little to no financial incentive in joining a bigger club, there still haven't been many players better than Harry Kane at this stage of their careers, who hadn't won a single piece of professional, senior, competitive silverware. Yes, I regret to inform you that Tottenham's success in the 2019 pre-season Audi Cup, which was the last ever Audi Cup as things stand, where they beat Bayern Munich 6-5 on penalties in the final, with Kane converting against his current club in the shootout, doesn't count as a trophy. And unlike in the case of Son, I don't think anyone would consider that to be remotely harsh. Kane has, of course, come pretty close to tasting success. He reached two EFL Cup finals with Spurs, one in 2015 and one in 2021, starting both but falling to 2-0 and 1-0 defeats against Chelsea and Man City at Wembley. He, along with Son of course, reached a Champions League final in 2019, playing the full 90 minutes once again as Spurs lost 2-0 against Liverpool this time, and he reached the final of Euro 2020 with England, captaining the three Lions as they gave up a 1-0 lead and went on to lose against Italy on penalties. So, last summer, following years of rumours, Kane finally left behind a team that is infamous for not winning major trophies, Tottenham, to join one that is famed for winning them, to an almost tedious extent, in the form of Bayern Munich. Bayern have literally won 11 Bundesliga titles in a row, in addition to winning two Champions Leagues and five DFB Pokals during that time. And yet, as most of you probably know, this season their prospects don't look quite so good. Bayer Leverkusen currently enjoy a massive 10-point lead at the top of the Bundesliga table and show few signs of letting up, whilst Bayern are only four points above Stuttgart in third. If there is one glimmer of hope for Kane, it is perhaps that Leverkusen are essentially the spurs of the Rhine in the sense that winning trophies isn't exactly a force of habit. Leverkusen are nicknamed Wieserkusen in German, which literally means second Kusen, owing to the fact that they have been Bundesliga runners-up five times without ever winning the league, they've lost three DFB Pokal finals having only ever won one, and they lost the Champions League final in 2002 having never been crowned as European champions. Bayern, by contrast, have winning in their DNA, but it would take a collapse of unprecedented proportions, even by Leverkusen standards, and a turnaround which defies anything that Bayern has ever done before, for Kane to lift a first league title this season, and they have already been humiliatingly knocked out of the DFB Pokal this season, in only the second round, against 3rd tier Zabrücken. 
Kane and Bayern's best shot at a trophy this season, therefore, is probably the UEFA Champions League, which they are the third favourites to win behind Manchester City and Real Madrid, having overcome Lazio in the round of 16. There is this pernicious, slightly bizarre idea that somehow still persists, that because of Kane's trophyless streak, perhaps teams are better off without him. With the greatest of respect, anyone who actually thinks that has feces for brains and ought to be sectioned. The idea that Spurs, England or Bayern would be better off without one of the best players in the world at the peak of their powers is, as should be obvious, absurd. Kane is already Tottenham and England's all-time leading goal scorer, and he has scored 36 goals and made 11 assists in 34 games since signing for Bayern. He has averaged a goal every 74 minutes in the Bundesliga so far this season. Arguably, he has been the best player in the league, and if the rest of the Bayern team had held up their side of the bargain, and even if they now went on to win the Champions League, Kane could well win the Ballon d'Or. As things stand, however, he has won nothing, and there have been few finer 30-year-old footballers in the entire history of the sport who still hadn't won anything at this stage of their careers. Anyway, that is it for today's video, but thank you all very much as ever for watching. I hope that you enjoyed it. Hit the like button if that was the case. Let me know your thoughts down below in the comments, and of course, goes without saying, by this stage at least, uh, make sure that you are subscribed and have notifications turned on for both this channel, HITC7s, and also my second channel, Alfie Potts Armor, both of which should be on or about to appear on your screens now, along with a couple of videos that you might enjoy watching after this one. You can also find me on Twitter, Instagram, or threads via the username at HITC7s on all three, and all of those links plus a whole lot more should be down in the video description below. Cheers.